WSB is the premier talk radio station in Atlanta, Georgia, and for decades, their signature tagline has been WSB Radio, depend on it. In saying this, the radio station was assuring its listeners that they could be certain of hearing the truth and could depend on the information they received. In essence, the station was guaranteeing the veracity of, the, uh, of their broadcast. Now, every, every one of us wants a guarantee that we can depend on, don't we? Uh, they want to know they can trust the company that makes or sells the product or service. And we hear of offers that come with guarantees. But then come all the exclusions in the fine print. Just recently, David was helping me at the house, putting up a little, wor little work around sealing in the, bo the bottom of our deck. And he told me his work was guaranteed. But he said as soon as his truck left the driveway, the guarantee expires. Well, we want to guarantee us a little bit better than that. You know, that's... A, that's a, we hear about all these guarantees, and we, they're, but they're only good as the offer. I mean, the company that stands behind them, and they find so many exclusions. That's why the only guarantees that we can be certain of are death and taxes. But you know, it's no different in our spiritual life. We want to know if our salvation is assured. In other words, we want a guarantee. It's a question that every believer has asked for, for, for 2,000 years. Is my salvation? secure. Until that question is settled, there's doubt, there's worry, there's uncertainty. Can I lose my salvation? What if I really mess up? Does God really love me? No one else does. But once this issue is settled, we can live freely and grow as a disciple knowing that our salvation is absolutely 100% guaranteed and assured. So as we come to the end of Romans chapter 8, we're about to be moved by a crescendo of praise that is punctured by seven questions. As we read verses 31 through 39, see if you can see and spot these seven questions. Read with me. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. While most of these questions are rhetorical, they're no less real. Paul uses a probing question and answering method to get us to personally pause and ponder all these amazing truths. Instead of using connected words, he uses a rapid fire staccato approach, moving quickly from one question to the next. Now, in the first eight chapters of, of Romans, Paul the preacher has given us a lot of information. But in these closing verses of chapter 8, he's moving from information to application to it so that we can experience transformation. And the very first question that he asks in this group of seven frames the entire passage. What then shall we say to these things? He's tying everything together about justification, sanctification, and glorification. And he's returning to the theme of no condemnation in verse 1. And he's also linking back to verse 28, where he, we learned how God makes all things work together for good. 
So when we ask this question, what then shall we say to these things? Two answers immediately come to mind. The first one is, I can't say anything. Have you ever received a totally undeserved or unexpected gift and you just couldn't find words to express how grateful you were? That happened to Jamie and I when, when Papa unexpectedly gave us a brand new car as a graduation gift and as a wedding gift. I mean, I, he did that and I was totally, completely speechless. Paul was stunned by the gift of salvation and the provision of sanctification. And when you consider what all God has done, what is it that we can say? Job experienced this in Job 40 verse 4 when he said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. So on the one hand, I can't say anything. But on the other hand, I must say everything. On the other hand, I should literally explode with praise and never stop God, thanking God for what all He has done. I'm reminded of what Jesus said about the crowd that was shouting Hosanna in Luke 1940. He said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. We have a lot to be thankful about and we must say everything praising God so on the one hand we're stunned by what he's done and can't say anything but on the other hand we need to be saying everything like water cascading over a waterfall these questions serve to celebrate our security in Christ and here's the main idea that Paul's trying to tell us if you are truly saved your salvation is totally secured. Now stop and think about that for a moment. If you are truly saved, your salvation is totally secure. From this passage, I see seven reasons why we should explode in worship because of that truth and know that these tr this is true, that our salvation is totally secure. The first reason is, is because Jesus protects us. Look at the question in verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, it's important that we read that question correctly. If Paul had asked... Who can be against us? The answer is, lots of people. But Paul's question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? And really the if is better translated as since. Since God is for us, who can be against us? It literally reads like this, because God is for us, who can be against us? That's not really a question, that's an exclamation. One pastor said it well this way. He said, there is no truth more fundamental in all of God's word than this truth. God is for us. God is not against us. God is not neutral toward us. Because of Jesus Christ, once and for all, the question is settled. God is for us. The word for means to be above, over, on behalf of, while against means to be down upon. So what this tells us is, is that God is up on you no matter who's down on you. No matter who looks down on you, God is always for you. If you're a born-again believer, He isn't angry with you. He is for you. Always has been, always will be. And since God is for us, what difference does it make who's against us? Others may intimidate us, but we have the Almighty on our side. Friend, listen, with God on your, our side, there is nothing anybody else can do to any of us. Psalm 118 verse 6 reads, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, Paul is not suggesting that we won't have any opposition because we do have adversaries. We all have adversaries. But the point he's making is that every opponent is puny compared to how big God is. Most of us judge whether God is for us or not by how events or circumstances turn out. If things in life are going well, then we say God is for us. When things go bad, we think, well, God is against us. 
But the truth is, if you are a born-again believer, God is always for you, no matter what happens. Now, I want to make this first per this promise personal. So to do that, I want you to insert your name into this verse right now. I want us to try it together. I'll say the first three words, and then you shout out your name to complete the sentence. You ready? God is for... Oh, C minus. C minus, class. God is for... If you are truly saved, your salvation is totally secure. There's a second reason we know this to be true. Jesus provides for us. Look at the, look at the second question, the third question in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The gift of God's Son is the promise and pledge that He not only protects us, He also provides for us. He gave Him up for us all. That means Jesus died in our place for our benefit, on our behalf, as our substitute. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. And the argument here is from greater to lesser. Since God did not hesitate to give the greatest gift of His Son, certainly He will not hesitate to give us the lesser gifts, if that's what He deems good for us. If He did, it would be like a dad building a full court basketball court for his son, but then not giving him a basketball to play with. The phrase, graciously gives us all things, does not refer just to health or wealth, but to everything that we need to handle all the hurts which come along our way. God has promised to meet our needs, not our greeds. God protects and He provides. Thus that means if you are truly saved, you are totally, your salvation is totally secured. There's a third reason. Jesus purifies us. Some years ago, a cartoon showed a, psychiat a psychologist talking to a patient. And the psychologist said, Mr. Figby, I think I can explain your feelings of guilt this way. You're guilty. <laughs> well, we're all guilty. We're all guilty of sin. We all fall short of God's glory. And when we repent and when we receive Christ, the Bible says we are justified or we are declared righteous. And then no one can bring a charge against us. Check out the question and quick answer in verse 33. He says, who will bring any charge against God as elect? It is God who justifies. Now my guess is, even though you've been saved, some of you may hear the accusing th anthem of guilt and shame on playback in your mind. On top of that, according to Revelation 12.10, Satan, whose name means adversary, brings accusations against Christians as he accuses them day and night before our God. Satan brings every flaw, every shortcoming, every sin up before God all the time. He keeps playing that back in your mind over and over and over again. Yeah, you say you're a Christian. You say you have salvation. But do you remember this? Do you remember that? He goes to God. God, look at him. You know how he was. You know what she did. But none of it sticks. Why? Because we have been purified positionally. We have been justified by God. And because God has justified us through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, no charge can be brought against us. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Hold on to what Isaiah says in chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises up against you in judgment. J.I. Packer wrote, 
Nobody can produce new evidence of your depravity that will make God change his mind. God justified you with his eyes wide open. God knows every detail about your past, and he justified you anyway. So if you are truly saved, your salvation is totally secured. Not only that, but Jesus also prays for us. That's another reason we need to break out in verse and into praise. Verse 34 says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Because no charge can be brought against us, we will not be condemned. Our sin deserves condemn condemnation. But Christ is sitting at the right hand of, of, the, of the Father, con commending us. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If Christ died for you, rose from the dead, sits at God's right hand, and intercedes for you, how could anybody possibly condemn you? One of my favorite hymns of all time is the hymn, And Can It Be? Listen to these words. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Our, our Savior is interceding for us, is praying for us. He commends, he doesn't condemn. It's like the lady caught in adultery where all of those men brought, him, brought her before Jesus and said the law says she must be stoned. She was caught in the very act. And Jesus simply said, let him without the first sin cast the first stone. Let him without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says they all left one by one. And then Jesus looked up to the lady and said these words, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No, Lord, no one. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. According to verse 26, the Holy Spirit is in in interceding in our hearts while the Son is interceding for us in heaven. The perfect one is praying for the imperfect us whom he has purified. We are protected, provided for, purified, and prayed for. So if you are truly saved, your salvation is totally secure. But there's a fifth reason. Jesus preserves us. Verse 35 begins with another question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? P Paul can barely contain his excitement as he exults in our security in Christ. I, I wonder, have you found yourself in circumstances and conditions of life which made you doubt God's love? For some of us, there's a nagging fear that if something goes wrong, we'll be disqualified and cut off from his love. To separate means to cut off. It's, 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 the Greek word is sometimes used as a synonym for amputate. But in Jeremiah 31.3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. What he's telling us is that we will never be cut off from his love. We will never be cut off from Christ, no matter what we go through. Then Paul lists seven troubles which have no power to separate us from the love of Christ. And it's interesting that Paul lists these items in answer to the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? We don't normally think of these inanimate objects as a who, but one, one pastor pointed out two reasons why. One is because they seem like a, a who when they're coming at us. Secondly, Paul wants to set up a, a contest, a contrast with a greater who. No matter who you have against you, we've got a who on our team who is greater than any who on the other side. Listen to how these 
how these troubles increase in intensity. Tribulation means to be squeezed or to break because of outward pressure. Distress is literally a narrow place. It's what happens inwardly when we feel hemmed in. The roller coaster of experiences and emotions cannot cut us off from God's love. Persecution refers to suffering because of your faith. Famine is a severe want for food. Nakedness speaks of the need for clothes or shelter and the embarrassment of being exposed. Danger is the idea of living in imminent and incessant peril. And swords refers to the slaughter knife and represents death. Interestingly enough, at the time he wrote these words, Paul had already experienced the first six of these and would eventually be martyred with the sword. He quotes Psalm 44, 23, to show suffering should not be estranged to us. It's a reminder of what to expect because God's people have always experienced opposition. Look at verse 36. He said, as it is written, for your sake, we are all being killed all all the day long we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered we all face trouble within and hardship without none of us will ever be separated from the love of God though no matter what opposition we face no matter what trouble or hardship none of it can separate us from the Savior nothing can break the bond between us and God those who are persecuted because of our faith will never be severed from the love of Christ Many of the Romans who were Christians heard these words and see them come true in their own life as Nero would throw Christians into the lions and burn believers at the stake. Even death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. One pastor captured it this way. The only thing that trouble can take away from you are the things that ultimately don't matter. The things that really matter, trouble cannot touch. So what is all this saying to us? If we are truly saved, your salvation is totally secure. There's a sixth reason. Jesus prepares us. According to verse 37, Jesus prepared us not only to survive, but to thrive. We're not just called to cope. We're called to be uber conquerors. Listen to what he says in verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, in the previous verse, in verse 36, we were compared to sheep to be slaughtered. Now we're being called more than conquerors. That's quite a jump going from sheep to conqueror but in Christ both are true the word conqueror means to overcome to dominate and utterly defeat in all these things we are more than conquerors this contrasts with just getting by Psalm 60 verse 12 says with God we will do valiantly we can be more than conquerors because Jesus Christ is the conqueror. That's what he said in John 16, 33. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We're called to be more than conquerors. Even though we're dealing with health issues, relational ruptures, financial trouble, stress on the job, or whatever persecution you may be facing because of your faith. The key is to think less about the power of things over you and more about the power of Christ which is within you. Because if you're truly saved, your salvation is totally secure. Then the last reason that we know this to be true is that Jesus promises us. Meditate on this promise that you are truly saved. Your salvation is totally secure. Meditate on this when life feels unstable and you can wonder what's going to happen next. 
Because verses 38 and 39 read this way. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How comforting, how reassuring it is to know that there is nothing that can sever our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul is personally persuaded and absolutely certain of this when he writes, For I am sure. It's in the present tense, the pre present perfect tense, which means I stand convinced. Nothing can change my mind. It wasn't at one time he was sure. He is continuously sure. The words neither and nor are absolute negatives, which can be translated not even anything whatsoever. Nothing can separate us from love of God. And so next, Paul lists extremes, which will never be able to separate us from God's love. And when he's done listing all these opposites, the conclusion is there's nothing that remains that could even come close to separating us from the love of Christ. He, he starts with the extremes of existence, neither life nor death. That covers the whole range of the human experience. For a believer, death is nothing but the doorway to heaven, and its sting has been removed by our Savior Jesus Christ. And for some of us, life seems to be more challenging than death in the first place. But there's the extremes of spiritual forces, nor angels nor rulers. No matter how strong they may be, angels can't cut us off from the love of Christ. Rulers probably refer to demons. Demons, Angels would not undo our relationship, and demons cannot undo our relationship with God. Nothing in the spiritual world can separate us from the love of God. There's the extremes of time, nor things present, nor things to come. There's nothing happening today which can move you out of the arms of Jesus. And there's nothing that will happen in the future that will fracture your relationship with Him. Nothing in time and nothing in eternity can separate us from God's love. There's the extreme of enemies, nor powers. Every power in the world is subservient to the power of Almighty God. And this likely was being referred to the government authorities who are antagonistic toward believers. And folks, let's just be frank. We're going to see more and more and more of this in the coming days, in the very near future. Because our government is doing everything we can to, to shut down the power and the presence of Jesus Christ and His followers. But nothing that the government can do can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. There's the extremes of space, nor height, nor death. Nothing in heaven can separate you. And the hell has no power over you. Nothing overhead, nothing underneath can unsettle you because nothing will swoop down to sweep you away and nothing can come to capsize you. And then there's the extremes of creation, nor anything else in all creation. Paul adds this just to make sure he didn't miss anything. This is a catch-all phrase to let us know that nothing in creation can sever God's love for us. When he says that nothing will be able to sever, is able to sever, sever our love, nothing will separate us from our love. The word is translated as dynamite. No amount of TNT can separate us from God's love. Now, it's, sometimes it's hard to feel safe in, in this world today. But if you know Jesus Christ, the new birth, and, you, and through Him you know the new birth, your relationship with Him is completely assured. So let's summarize what Paul has told us. Jesus protects us. Jesus provides for us. Jesus purifies us. Jesus prays for us. Jesus preserves us. Jesus prepares us. Jesus promises us. And what does all that tell us? If you are to truly saved, your salvation is totally secured. Folks, God's love for us is unconditional and sacrificial, and it is fully expressed in the death of His Son on our behalf. 
It's, 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 it's interesting to me to know that Romans 8 started with no condemnation and it ends with no separation. These promises will never be reversed. They will never be revoked. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. One un anonymous pastor put it this way. God's purpose is unchangeable. His power is unchallengeable. His love is unconditional. So there is nothing I have to fear. I am who you say I am. The who of my salvation is greater than the who of my opposition. And I am more than a conqueror. Church, it doesn't get any better than that. So Paul asks seven questions so that we could know that if we're truly saved, our salvation is totally secure. So today I want to close with one more question, a question of my own, and it's a big one. It's actually the question. Are you truly saved? Have you repented and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? If you haven't, and if you don't, then one day God is going to be against you. So today, don't delay a decision. Receive Jesus Christ into your life right now. Admit you are a sinner. Believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead. And confess him with your mouth as Lord and Savior. Receive Him into your life right now and then forever be totally secure in your salvation. If you are truly saved, your salvation is totally secure. Father God, we, all we can say is thank you. Thank you for the gift of salvation that you've made possible to all people through your son Jesus Christ when he died on the cross he died for all when he raised, was raised from the dead he was resurrected for all and he offers to us the forgiveness of sin the righteousness which he has provided for us and he offers us the gift of eternal life while it is made available to all, it's not automatic. We have to reach out and receive it. So may we do just that. May today, those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, profess you, their, profess their faith in you, and confess you to be their Lord and Savior. For those who are doubting, who are not sure, who are wavering, May today be the day we draw a line in the sand and say from this day forward we will doubt no more. And for all of us who are truly saved, then may we have total assurance of that salvation and the freedom that comes within it so that we can live for you, testify about you, burst out in praise, and let a dark world know you are the light of the world who came to seek and to save that which is lost. Lord, what we're simply asking is that you take our life and consecrate it for you, for your purposes, for your benefit, for your glory. For this is our prayer, and we know it is your will. This we pray in your holy name. Thank <laughs> you.